the, the reason why people really pay attention to that, it, I think it's because it communicates something. It communicates that, hey, we care about those little things, even something as trivial as a sidebar icon. Um, and we do that throughout the app with every little interaction. And I think that communicates something. That's why people always ask that, uh, like, how did you do that? How did you do that? Uh, so interesting. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Founder Q&A video. This is the moment where we talk about everything related to recent. And this time, I brought another guest here with us, Zeph Fernandez. And we're going to go straight into the first question, which is, who is your designer? You bring me to just to answer these questions, then. <laughs> uh, it's me. <laughs> I'm a designer of recent. I joined uh, five months ago. And um, I'm a designer based on Brazil, in Rio, and super excited to work on Resend and in the developer experience world. I think we have a lot of things to do and bring this design mindset is always a good outcome. Yeah, no, I'm, we're super excited, super lucky to have you here with us. Eh? And the second question, maybe a little bit harder than the first one, is from Eric, and he asks, how is the design process on recent? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think we have two different uh, design process in recent, one for marketing, one for product. Um, for the marketing part, um, we kind of have a mindset to create templates for everything that we do. And these templates are not just like, um, images that we can reproduce, but for the styles, the assets, things that we can just like um, play around with the order, sort a little bit the, the, the components and having a different image or a different thing generate there. Um, because you're a very small team. So I think that's important for us to keep the quality of everything that we post and uh, show to the world, but it's still having like the speed that is necessary for the startup. On the product side, I don't know if you then want to talk a little bit about but it's, it's a little bit different, the, the, the mindset, the way that we work. Yeah, so for the product, uh, I, I feel like it's very fluid, right? Uh, there are companies that I worked before where everything starts on Figma and that's the source of truth. And then you move to the browser down the line. And we do have times where we do that path, uh, but I feel like for us, it's like, it depends on the feature. Sometimes we're like, just we go straight to the browser and maybe that takes a little bit longer, to be honest. Maybe if we should have started on Figma, we, we would go faster, but it's just like a the the place where we feel comfortable doing stuff. So there are many occasions where we did that. And, and sometimes we feel like if there's less certainty about a certain feature, then we just go to Figma, explore different versions. And then when we feel more confident, we move to the browser. Is that a good... Uh, description yeah, of the process. Yeah, it's, it's How would you describe it? One thing that I love about like working with you and the entire team is this mindset mm -hmm. because I'm a strong belief that design and development are not different, um, are not like different thing you should separate or being a waterfall. It's a very iterative process between these two disciplines, uh, and I love that we are doing this on recent um, because in the end, for me, the, this like this translation point when you have like things on Figma or any other tool that you work and you need to translate everything to code, you lose so much on these translations. Um, even the the part of exploring this different media. So that's why I, I like that we're doing things on browser. Uh, and Figma works for us more as a a, a place for us to sketch and have an overall idea that what we're going to build and then just go to the code and, and use the media that people you, you experience like the, the the real thing. So I think that's that's a nice thing to, to do. And then I love this on our product side. Yeah, you can have the most organized Figma file ever, but then if you do a shitty implementation on the web, it's all for nothing, right? So we, we really need to be able to yeah. be organized and do all the stuff that's required but always keep in mind that the end result is in a different medium. So optimize for that medium at the end of the yeah. day. Even when we start polishing some, some interactions, it's so good to use um, the, the browser and the, the UI, the code, because you can you have this extra layer of interactions. Uh, some design tools don't have that. So it's, it's good for you to like polishing these things, like how the mouse goes and, and how this behavior. So I think you have more powerful. More power, more power. 
Okay, the next question, Zeno, uh, that's for you. Uh, and I like that it's for you and not for me because this one is hard. <laughs> uh, it's from Twitter. Uh, how do you plan to maintain a good UX UI as the product gets more complex? Yeah, man, this is so hard. It, it's tricky because once you start a new product, you know, doing something simple um, is the easy route. You have very few features and you're trying to figure out how you're going to uh, do these things. And as you add more functionality, as you listen to users and implement the things that they ask, uh, it gets to a point where the product is bloated. Um, I feel like for us, I wish we had the perfect answer to this question. Uh, I wish we knew like, oh, if you only do this, then uh, all your problems are going to be resolved. I think it's a matter of discipline to always be looking into ways to not overly complicate the product. Even this morning, you and I were discussing about a change on the overview page and we're like, ah, maybe this is too much to be here, right? Uh, and I feel like this is always the case where you always have to be vigilant about any addition that you, you're going to do and always think if that's the essential, like if what you're trying to put in the screen is, is that really the place to be? Is that really what the users need right now? And sometimes you can make those decisions from like a gut feeling as a user, I feel that way. Other times we just have to talk to them and, and, and get that answer. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, it's, what do you as think? You mentioned, it's a mindset that we, we need to always have it to search for ascension. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think like principles are very good for that. Like if we define that our product is to be a simpler, simpler because of the competitors and that that's the experience that we want to bring, uh, we should always follow that. Um, and it's, as you, you mentioned, it's a day to day work. The next question is about design systems. Uh, Lucas, uh, asked from LinkedIn, what do you use for the design system? Yep. Uh, that's a good one. Um, we treat the code as the source of truth. So of course we have some components and things on Figma, but what matters is what we have on code. Um, and then we are using Radix uh, and Tailwind for, for the stack. This is one of those cases where we understand the importance of having a design system, uh, but we, we've also worked in places where the amount of time you spend on design system is sometimes higher than the actual product. And then teams are being forced into one thing or another. And so at this moment with the, the size of the team that we have, we feel like we don't need something extremely complicated, uh, but we need a foundation and Radix is that foundation for us. Yeah, exactly. And um, having these rules um, like colors and, and, what it will be on the borders, what it will be in the background. I think this is design system. Sometimes we got like um, lost in some, a lot of tools to use that, to manage that. But in the reality, a design system is like a set of rules and these rules can be translated to a Figma or can be translated to code. Uh, so what we try to do is have being vigilant about these rules that we set. The next question from Rafael Pinheiro from LinkedIn. Uh, who designed the landing page? I've worked with this guy called Vitor Viezzi, who is just an amazing, super talented designer. Uh, and we've worked for years at LifeRay. So he, he's a big friend of mine. And uh, when we're thinking about like, okay, we need something that can be really impactful. Otherwise, what's the point of even doing this, right? So we're like, no, let, let's make sure we can really communicate the values and the things that we believe in this landing page. Uh, and we invited Vitor uh, to work on that project. And then Zed jumped in, Boo jumped in. This was like a group effort, right? Where we're always like uh, trying to, I think that's the beauty of the way we work. We see a task and then maybe someone gets to like 80% of that. And then someone comes in, does the, the that 20% left and, we keep always like switching who does which part, uh, but for the landing page, uh, yeah, that was a really, really, really interesting project. And there's a lot that we still want to do, you know, that's just the beginning. 
Yeah, but one thing that I really like the process, and I, I think then you can talk more about, but the how uh, the team shaped the content. So the everything start on the content and then goes to like the interactions, the visuals, but like the mockups of the content. I think that's a very interesting process. Yeah, we we use Balsamic for that, and I, I really love that tool. Uh, it, it later we like kind of recreated Balsamic on Figma just to be easier to collaborate. Uh, but the idea is like you have a black and white canvas, and the beauty of that is you're really like you're constrained about just thinking about the content because it's it's just so easy to be lost into you know the interactions, which we really want to make them look amazing. But if you have a weak content, then you know uh, you can have like the most flashy thing in the world. But the storytelling is very important. Like how people will read the, the landing page. Yeah, the way that the sections would flow, maybe the order of the sections. We had a lot of discussions about that, right? Maybe this should be here. Maybe this should be there. I, I really like to think, um, when I'm thinking about landing pages, I like to think as a keynote presentation where you have like one slide and that's your monitor. And you keep like, from a storytelling perspective, thinking like, oh, maybe we should start here. Maybe we should end there. And once you have all those pieces together, you can move them around and and see how it fits. The next one is how, this is from David Parks. Uh, he asks, how do you create those sick icons in the app and the homepage? Nice, yeah, yeah. We have some contractors as well. Uh, they did a brilliant work on it. Um, and I think that's the, the nice part of the landing page, like it's the, this, like everyone touches a little bit and talk a little bit more about, uh, but they are amazing. Um, Max did the, the animated um, uh, icons and Foss did the recent logo and recent um, on the bottom of the, the footer. Yeah, w w one of the things, and maybe we can even pop up here in the video, but yeah, uh, there's sure. so much love uh, on those icons that people don't even, Imagine so. There's one icon, where and this whole section where we we say integrate this morning, this afternoon, tonight, or integrate this weekend, based on your local time zone. And when you look at this icon, if you're looking at this during the morning, then the light comes in a different direction. If you're looking uh, like during the afternoon, then the light is in the center. If you look like integrate tonight, then the light is on. On the other way so there's just like uh the level of attention to detail is just incredible and for the the app the icons on the app which we get that a lot too people ask like oh like those animated icons on the sidebar uh like how did you do that there's a library called lord icons that we use uh, along with um lottie to animate those and i feel the, the reason why people really pay attention to that, it, I think it's because it communicates something. It communicates that, hey, we care about those little things, even something as trivial as a sidebar icon. Um, and we do that throughout the app with every little interaction. And I think that communicates something. And that's why people always ask that, uh, like, how did you do that? How did you do that? Uh, so interesting. Cool. Uh, the next one. Um, Zenum, any plans for book sending or newsletter features? Uh, question um, from Twitter. Yes. That's a good one. That's we, a good one. This is, <laughs> man, we get that question all the time. Um, you know, we, once we started recent, the idea was we need a simple API to send one email. And we've been like looking at all the different ways to make that better uh, in terms of like the speed, the, the performance, the consistency and the, the durability of that API. But, you know, people have different use cases and sometimes they want to send 500 emails at once or 1000 emails at once. And they don't want to loop through this API and do 500 rest uh, API calls, right? So, Bulk sending is something that we are actively working. In fact, we have a beta going on. Uh, I can drop the link on the um, on the on the video here. But the idea is 
uh, that you can already start playing with this bulk API. And for newsletter, that's, uh, I feel like that, that's, maybe you should take this one, Zev. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think we are excited after like finishing the book, what we can do on the newsletter or how can I say like a broadcast, no? when you want to send emails for an audience or for a lot of people. And we are looking at this um, because right now we see a lot of friction on, on, on how you send that. Um, and I think we have big opportunities to remove these frictions and keep the focus on developers as well. I think, um, I think the mindset of the developers working on newsletter features or a broadcast that they want to send for um, a bunch of people are different from like a creator. So how can, what we can do uh, to optimize and remove all the friction uh, on this process. And I think the friction is, is like start from like images. You always need the images hosted in somewhere and then it's hard to access. You need to do all this process. So how can we optimize for that? And how can we optimize for you to not write all the HTML code? Um, so I think it's have a lot of opportunities and you're excited to, to have something um, soon. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Zaf, for coming. This was really cool, man. I, I love jamming and talking about design with you. This is awesome. I think and... you should do more. I want yeah. to answer more questions about design <laughs> and even to review a little bit about our process. I think it's nice to, we put some, a lot of thought on everything that we do. It would be nice to like to explain a little bit. And of course, other people can uh, teach things for us and we can teach things for other people too. That's awesome. See you, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye.